Anyway, so yeah, so I'm here to tell you today about our benchtop high resolution NMR uh, spectrometer for teaching and research. And uh, we call the spectrometer Cat Boy, here it is. The NMR ready. So throughout the last uh, 40 or 50 years or so, um, companies like uh, Brooker, um, Varian, now now Agilent, and uh, Oxford and so forth have been doing some truly amazing um, uh, advancements in uh, the versatility and power of uh, NMR instrumentation. But um, uh, my company, Analysis, um, which was uh, developed, uh, started in Calgary uh, in 2009, uh, we've taken a different approach. So most of the time, what you really want to do is something very, very simple in it. You want to take some kind of routine measurement. There are lots of fantastically powerful multiple pulse experiments that you can do, but very often you just want to know whether your reaction worked. Okay. So what we've done is to develop a, a, a proton NMR spectrometer that fits on the bench top, and our focus has been to make uh, NMR instrumentation easy to use, compact, and affordable. Okay. So just a couple of technical specifications. Uh, the spectrometer uh, takes proton NMR spectra at 60 megahertz. Okay, it, uh, it does so in a shielded 1.4 Tesla uh, permanent magnet, and so there are no cryogens at all. No liquid helium fills, no liquid nitrogen fills, there isn't any, even any cooling water. Okay, so there are other technical specifications here, for example, signal to noise. Uh, the signal to noise basically is good enough to take NMR of moderately concentrated solutions in a couple of minutes. The most important uh, technical detail, though, is the resolution. Okay, so the resolution is about 3 hertz. Um, that number should be very familiar to you if you're an organic chemist because typical three bond proton proton J couplings are on the order of five hertz, right? And so anything which is not giving you resolution in this range isn't really a chemically relevant anymore spectrometer if it's 20 hertz or 30 hertz or 50 hertz, okay? So the basic idea is you can see J couplings. So here's a, 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 an NMR spectrum of ethyl benzene, and you can quite clearly see both the uh, methylene quartet and the methyl uh, triplet right there, and it's quite well resolved. Certainly well enough uh, resolved for a student taking a spectrum in an organic chemistry lab to fully identify. Okay, uh, the spectrometer weighs about 40 pounds, and it features a, uh, a touch screen operator interface. So uh, I said that uh, NMR should be very simple to use, and so our one-touch NMR user interface features a few very commonly used uh, parameters, for example, the number of scans, the interscan uh, time, and uh, the spectral width, and basic, and, and also a parameter for uh, the solvent that you're using. So the uh, spectrometer has a, a laundry list of a few uh, solvents whose uh, diamagnetic susceptibility it knows, and so it does the shimming for you most of the time. Uh, you push the go button, and you get an NMR spectrum. Okay. Uh, this, uh, This right here is a, we have a little YouTube video, which um, uh, you can go visit, um, and that will show you some of the features of our uh, features of our user interface. But the basic idea is the spectrum pops up, and uh, you can do many things that you would want to do with an NMR spectrum. So you can horizontally zoom to focus in on some of the multiples. You can vertically zoom. You can put on a grid. You can change from ppm to hertz. You can integrate the spectrum or produce a peak list or you can uh, do phase adjustments and baseline correction and that sort of thing. Um, you can also save a spectrum or compare it to other spectra that you may have um, taken. Okay, so here's a real example. Uh, this is 4 prime hydroxypropiophenone, um, and it's a uh, sort of right in the sweet spot of the applicability of this uh, of the instrument. Uh, it's a small molecule, and by small molecule I mean something that's sort of under about 400 meters. 500 grams per mole. You can see the spectrum here. Uh, it's got its five multiplets from the five uh, chemically distinct uh, sets of protons. One, two, three, four, five. Right? You see all of those. And in addition, you can see all the J couplings in the molecule. So a student taking an OCHEM lab could identify this as easily as he could something that was taken from a 400 megahertz spectrum. Okay. So you may have noticed that the concentration here is a bit high. It's about uh, 35 or so uh, milligrams in half a milliliter. And um, that's high if you're used to taking 
NMR spectra with your 400 or 500 megahertz instrument. But if you're going to do a synthesis, an aldol condensation or an electrophilic substitution or something like that in your lab with your students, you're probably going to be making a few hundred milligrams anyway, right? And so this is ideal for taking that sort of thing. This spectrum was taken in about two minutes. Okay, um, I said that the NMR already does uh, proton spectroscopy, but you can also get it as a uh, fluorine, a fluorine 19 spectrometer. Okay, um, we also have an option in which you can get uh, fluorine 19 and proton spectroscopy software switching. Okay, so here's uh, fluorine uh, 19 spectrum of um, octafluorotoluene, and once again, you can see all of the multiplets and the decouplings we saw the chemical ranges substantially broader than that. Okay, so now I want to talk about what I really sort of came here to talk about, um, which is uh, using the, the NMR Ready uh, benchtop spectrometer in an undergraduate organic chemistry laboratory. So um, uh, I'd like to talk about a couple experiments that uh, you OCHEM professors may already be doing and how the NMR Ready um, can be used there. Okay, so isolation of caffeine. That's something that some of my colleagues um, did uh, when I was uh, teaching at the Claremont Colleges in California. And uh, it's a relatively straightforward experiment that you can do pretty early on in the term. Again, many of you may already be doing something like this. Uh, caffeine is relatively straightforward to purify. Um, you can extract it from strong tea with something like chloroform or dichloromethane. And you can either recrystallize it or even sublime it. Um, it's a complex structure, uh, something that you might not want to hit the suits up with right off the bat. Uh, but uh, most students, of course, like most, many of us, are very familiar with caffeine. Um, it's got a very simple spectrum. Okay, so uh, if you look at the if you look at the spectrum here, you know you'll notice that there are no J couplings in the molecule, no free bond J couplings. And so you're going to get you're going to expect four singlets. And the spectrum I'm about, I'm about to show you uh, took about 45 milligrams of uh, caffeine and uh, about. So there's the spectrum. This is taken with the NMR Ready spectrometer, like I said, in just over five minutes. And as you can see, there are one, two, three, four uh, chemically inequivalent protons and one, two, three, four singlets uh, in a one to three to three to three ratio, as you would expect uh, as verified by the intervals. Okay, so here's a, a somewhat more complicated experiment that you might use later on in the term. Uh, again, in, in, in uh, first or second term of organic chemistry uh, that relates to uh, electrophilic aromatic substitution. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and the electrophile uh, of interest is bromination. Is, uh, brom so we brominate um, the uh, aromatic ring, and um, as you know, uh, there is a certain uh, regio isomerism that uh, is um, shown in this kind of a reaction where you can substitute at the para, the ortho, or the meta position. And given an excess of bromine, you may also expect uh, multiply brominated products. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, uh, Jennifer Luft, who's a, a former colleague of mine at, uh, at uh, Claremont Colleges, for contributing to some of this work. OK, so this is a relatively straightforward reaction. It could be done in room temperature uh, using a, a, a conical vial of 5 millimeters or so, and like I said, a, a, a few, you know, maybe 90 milligrams or something like that of, of uh, starting material. And uh, the preparations are readily available in places like uh, JCAM Ed. So uh, the, pr the, the prep with which I was most familiar is an addition of liquid bromine, or rather a bromine solution. But you might not want to use bromine uh, with your undergraduates in, in a laboratory. And so this is, in fact, a very nice uh, preparation uh, that uses a redox reaction um, by uh, Paul Schatz, uh, which just uses powdered potassium bromate in an acidic solution, and it makes uh, the bromine in situ. OK, so what uh, do you see uh, in the spectrum? Well, uh, if you use um, anisole as your nucleophile, right, so we would expect to have the methoxy group on the anisole um, activate the ring, right? because the lone pair on the oxygens um, can be donated into the ring by residence expect to activate both the ortho and the para regions of the aromatic ring. And sure enough, you do the reaction, and um, under one-to-one -one stoichiometric conditions, you see the para isomer. 
well. Um, many of the articles that you see in, um, in uh, JChemEd and elsewhere will tell you that you derivatize it or take a melting point or do something, something else. Um, but uh, why not take an NMR spectrum? That's what organic chemists do when they want to know the structure. So uh, here's a, a p-bromoanisole product of the reaction, and you can clearly see the three uh, inequivalent sets of protons, um, the methyl residents, uh, these are the two to two, uh, three ratio, as you would expect from the integrals. And um, here is the aromatic region, and you can see the two doublets there. And um, the J coupling there is something like 8 hertz, and it's pretty clearly resolved. And you can also see another thing you can show the students is this, this para effect, this leaning that you expect to see when the chemical shift difference between the uh, relevant protons is on the order of, or maybe a little more than the J-hub. What to say about that a little bit? Okay, so you can do the electrophilic substitution with several different compounds with your students. Um, another one that's of interest is a is a very strongly activated uh, aromatic compound, aniline. And so the amino group, as you know, um, is a very strongly activating substituent. Right, the nitrogen atom there is substantially less electronegative than the oxygen, and so this, this electron here, here is very hot, and it makes the, the ring very susceptible to uh, electrophilic attack by the bromine. And in an excess of bromine, you end up getting the tri-substituted product. And if you take an NMR with the NMR ready, the aromatic region exhibits a very sharp singlet uh, from the protons. And this uh, is the This is TMS. Long ago we used TMS rather than just looking at the residual solvent. That's an easy thing to do with the animal. All right. So um, moving on, you can also look. At, I'm going to look at a third uh, substituent here. The acetamido group in acid acetaldehyde is less strongly activating because this hot electron pair there on the nitrogen is to some extent extinguished by its resonance with the nearby oxygen, and so this is substantially less nucleophilic. And so uh, the product, even in excess bromine, is just the para substituent. It's still an activated substituent, but not quite as well, not quite as much as aniline. So what we would expect would be maybe some crazy activity here in the, uh, in the aromatic region with these two uh, in equivalent sets of protons. But in fact, what we see is a single one. And the reason there is because while the, these two protons here those two protons there have diff different chemical shifts. Their chemical shifts are actually substantially lower than the J-coupling. And so that paraleaning that we saw earlier in the, um, in the uh, anisole uh, has really sort of compressed this into, you can sort of see the, the two leftover peaks on the side there. Um, but this is clearly a second order spectrum. Okay. okay. Um, I'd like to talk now a little bit, switch gears, and just kind of finish up and tell you a little bit about uh, some of the hardware again. The NMR Ready um, can connect via Ethernet or wireless uh, to a network. So you can share files, for example. Your students can acquire a spectrum in four or five minutes on the spectrometer and then do their post processing offline in, uh, in uh, standard. NMR workup kind of programs, for example, ACD or um, NMR Pipe or Mestre Nova or any other, uh, other uh, software. And in fact, the native data format of the NMR Ready is JCAMP DX. And so all of that data is, is readily exported. You can also just uh, take the data off with a, with a USB drive, a memory stick, or you can just hit a button and have, it, have, the, have your students print out the spectrum right there. Or, again, like I said, they can uh, move the spectrum uh, with a click touch the screen uh, onto uh, a, a network where they can post-process the spectrum and incorporate it into a Microsoft Word document or something like that. If you're using the NMR Ready in your research, you can even have the NMR Ready email you when it finishes the same. Okay. Um, lastly, I wanted to uh, put up the Help Wanted sign and say that um, we're really interested in finding out how the NMR Ready 
so we would very much like to hear your ideas and uh, better yet partner with you. And analysis uh, sponsors uh, customers development of curricula involving NMR reviews. And uh, if you want to know uh, more information about the product or the company, you can go to uh, www.analysis.com. Again, that my YouTube video is quite pop up there, but that's okay. We, uh, you can go ahead and search NMR Ready on YouTube and um, uh, have a look at the NMR Ready uh, in its operation, or you can visit us outside of the booth, or you can follow us uh, on Twitter. And, uh, thanks for your attention.